Good afternoon. Today is April 9th, and the National Council on Electricity Policy would like to welcome Argonne National Laboratory to our virtual meeting. Uh, the National Council um, thanks Argonne for their participation today and your ongoing efforts to contribute to the industry at large and particularly um, any assistance you provide to state agencies. Today on our webinar, we will hear from Argonne on um, their lab generally, and then we're highlighting two project of, projects of theirs, the Energy Zones Mapping Tool, which is a GIS-based tool with over 300 data layers. The next project is the uh, Valuation Guidance and Techno-Economic Studies for Pump Storage Hydropower. Um, we actually have um, in the handouts, uh, there is the slide deck, and then also a handout that further explains um, this project. It is forthcoming. It is something that we are in the middle of, so um, uh, Vladimir will get to those details in a moment, but um, just noting that. We will have time for Q&A, and um, uh, my name is Carrie Worthington. I am with Nehruk. Um Please email me at any time. Um, but with the Q&A, uh, the webinar will be recorded, and any questions that you have um, should be submitted through the chat function of the GoToWebinar application. I'm getting some feedback, so I'm just pausing for a minute. Um, yes, please ask your questions through the chat function. If um, you're on the phone, please email me at kworthington at naruc.org. Um, any questions uh, that are clarifying, we'll ask them immediately, and any other questions that might um, have a further discussion, we'll wait until the end. Uh, but please submit your questions at any time. I also have my colleague Charles Harper helping me out today with filtering the questions and uh, making sure the audio goes well. So thank you, Charles. Um, after the webinar, the uh, presentation um, will be posted on YouTube, and we'll link that to the NCEP website. Um, as I mentioned, the presentation is available through the GoToWebinar system. It is also already on the website. Any unanswered questions that you might submit to us will be forwarded to um, Vladimir and Jim, and uh, unless you'd like to remain anonymous, then I'll do um, some liaison there. If you're interested in NCEP more and you'd like to join our listserv, um, click it as a interest area in your My Neighbors account or just contact me. Um, if you're interested in uh, just a quick intro on the National Council on Electricity Policy, it is a peer learning platform to examine the new ways that technologies, policies, regulations, and markets impact states, state resources, and the bulk power system. We are currently exploring the evolution between the transmission distribution systems as the resource mix on the grid changes. And we have three sub um, subtopics there, planning, operations, and markets. And then um, aside from that, we also do a lot to uh, break down the silos of the state agencies, the multiple state agencies that work on electricity policy. Um, a few of them, a few of them are there listed on the, on the right. So um, I wanted to mention that NCEP is a project of NARU, the National Association of Regulatory Commissioners, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, um, but it is uh, a space for any state um, agency to participate in these types of discussions. All of our materials are on the web. Without further ado, I would like to introduce one of our National Council on Electricity Policy Executive Committee members, the Honorable Ted Thomas from the Arkansas Public Service Commissioner. Uh, he is moderating our webinar today, and he um, has a law background, but he's very sharp, and we are lucky to have him here. So, um, Commissioner Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, NCP has brought in Argonne to discuss a few projects uh, for states to consider. Uh, this is the first of several interviews that NCP, NCEP is initiating to better connect states with our national laboratory system. There are lots of good work being done there. Uh, the labs both support uh, work that the states do and then offer broader analytical tools. Um, what we will do today is we will present uh, two subject matter experts and let them uh, tell you some of the things that they're thinking about, and hopefully that will assist state decision makers 
in uh, determining uh, the public interest. Um, today, we will have Vladimir Korotorov, who is Manager of Power Systems and Market Research Group at Argonne National Laboratory. He is a senior fellow, also a senior fellow at the University of Chicago's Energy Policy Institute with the great acronym EPIC. Uh, Vladimir is an electrical engineer with over 30 years of experience in the analysis of hydro and thermal power systems, production costs, and capacity expansion uh, modeling, integration of renewable energy, energy storage, and power market analysis. Before joining Argonne in 1991, Vladimir worked with the power system planner in the electric power utility in Yugoslavia. We also have uh, Jim Kuiper. Uh, Jim is, let me get my thing right. Work at home is not all that it's cracked up to be. <laughs> there we go. Jim is a principal geospatial engineer in, environmental, in the environmental science division at Argonne. Some of his recent projects include studying energy corridors in the Western US, coding an outage model for hurricane forecasts, developing a tool to generate geospatial summaries of client modeling results and supporting several web-based mapping tools. He is a technical coordinator for the Energy Zone mapping tool uh, that we'll discuss today. His main interests are applying geosp geospatial analysis and modeling to energy and environmental problems and sharing results and data via web-based tools. But what we'll do first is we'll have Vladimir give us a general description of Argonne National Laboratories and the work that they do there. Uh, Vladimir? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Argonne National Laboratory with the Energy Systems Division at Argonne. And I'm going to give you just uh, a brief uh, five-minute overview of the lab. Uh, so here you see the lab on the slide, the picture. You know, it's uh, basically a campus that is uh, outside of Chicago, and it's a pretty vast campus, 1,500 acres and so on. So, Kerry, please, uh, next slide, please. So Argonne uh, is one of 17 national laboratories that are owned by the U.S. Department of Energy. And Argonne was uh, founded in 1943 and established as a national lab in 1946. And it's located uh, just outside of Chicago, 25 miles uh, southwest of Chicago. Uh, next slide, please. So Argonne has a very you know, diverse uh, research uh, portfolio, and uh, it's a multidisciplinary lab. Our operating budget is just about uh, $1 billion. Uh, and we do end-to-end -end research from basic discovery to applications. We also have a number of user facilities that are integrated with our research and also available to outside users from universities, industry, and so on. And we have many, many collaborations that we'll be speaking later on. Next slide. Yeah. So Argon is mostly focused on solving big problems in science and engineering, and we have five major initiatives that are shown uh, at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so the first one is the hard X-ray science. Uh, we have the APS, Advanced Photon Source, which is the brightest uh, photon uh, light source uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And then uh, we also have, uh, we host uh, several super supercomputers on Argon site, uh, and uh, some of those uh, computers were the fastest at uh, you know times. Uh, in the world, and uh, next year we're going to be again on the top because uh, we have, uh, you know, Aurora coming, and that's going to be exascale computer. So it's going to be the fastest computer in the world that is available to open science. We also do research in basic uh, development of materials and chemistries in manufacturing of, uh, you know, science and uh, engineering, and also in universe. Universe as our lab is one of our initiatives. Uh, and there are two emerging initiatives on top. One is the artificial intelligence for science, and the other is the quantum computing or quantum information science. Uh, next slide, please. So our researchers and uh, discoveries are uh, widely recognized. We have received over 120 R&D 100 awards. Uh, we have uh, thousands of inventions and patents. Uh, we have received uh, over 700 national and international awards and so on. And we also have uh, three Nobel Prize winners, uh, Enrico Fermi, Maria Gopard-Meyer, and Alexei Abrikosa. 
And Enrico Fermi was also Argonne's uh, first laboratory director after the World War II. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a very diverse, uh, world-class community of talent. Uh, Argonne employees uh, are, uh, we have about uh, over 3,200 uh, of employees of which uh, over 1,300 are uh, scientists and engineers. We have close to 8,000 facility users. So those are not employed by Argonne, but those are outside the university and industry people that come to Argonne and do their research on our facilities. We also have uh, almost 800 visiting researchers. Uh, about 340 of Argonne employees are holding joint faculty positions with various uh, universities in the US and so on. And we typically host about uh, 600 students uh, every year on Argonne site, uh, mostly during the summer internship uh, programs. Next slide. And, uh, you know, our partnerships uh, span, uh, uh, you know, companies of different sizes from startups uh, to Fortune 500s. Uh, and these are just uh, some of those that are illustrated in several of the sectors like uh, manufacturing, energy, information technology, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, so we have many, many partnerships, uh, and uh, uh, you know we are very proud of that because we do collaborate uh, a lot with the, the industry and and also academia and research institutions. So that is uh, just a very brief overview, Argon, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions if there are any. Thank you. Any questions in terms of? Argon generally, although assisting states is not necessarily in your mission statement, the resources and expertise of the lab uh, can assist states in making decisions and developing policies. Um, would you give me a couple of projects uh, that that come to mind, please, and then we'll discuss those in detail. Oh yes, I mean uh, we have a uh, uh, very very. Uh, extensive collaboration of the states uh, and the state energy offices, public utility commissions, and uh, planning organizations within states, and so on. And uh, you know that has been uh, something that we have conducted uh, for many, many years. Uh, and uh, they cover different fields. So I am uh, mostly familiar with the energy, but uh, you know that's also something that uh, covers uh, other fields as well. So in the energy, I would just mention, yes, the energy zones mapping tool was uh, the tool that was developed for Eastern Interconnection States Planning Council. And uh, later on, uh, you know, it first covered uh, only the Eastern Interconnection. And then later on, it was extended to cover all of the lower 48 states in the U.S. Then uh, this uh, pump storage hydro evaluation project that we'll be talking a little bit uh, later uh, is also looking into how to help uh, uh, regulators uh, properly value and assess uh, the pump storage projects, uh, either if they are coming uh, through IRPs in uh, regulated utilities or if they are coming as IIPs in uh, restructured markets and so on. Uh, we also have uh, a new project that is just starting, and that is a uh, foundational technical assistance project uh, uh, this is uh, funded by DOE through the Grid Modernization Initiative. It's, uh, Argon is leading a multi-lab team that is providing technical assistance uh, to uh, transmission operators and uh, ISOs and RTOs. And, of course, uh, states, uh, you know, these uh, regional, regional transmission networks, they, they span multiple states. So, so there are a lot of uh, issues that are of interest to states there. We also have a number of projects that uh, we are uh, helping states with. Uh, for example, you know, we have uh, power system resilience and restoration modeling, a suite of tools for, for that. Uh, and currently we're working in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, helping Puerto Rico recover from uh, Hurricane Maria. And uh, uh, we also have a tool which is called uh, Head Out. It stands for Hurricane Electrical Assessments Outage Damage. And that one is used uh, since, uh, since uh, you know, it was developed uh, after Superstorm Sandy, and since then has been used always uh, by DOE uh, to assess uh, potential damages uh, that may be occurring because of the hurricane. So, so the tool actually uses the uh, 
trajectories, uh, forecasted trajectories for the hurricane, and then assesses how many customers uh, uh, may be out of power, how many uh, transmission lines and the power stations will be affected, and so on. And those estimates have been, uh, you know, used for several years now. For, for example, Hurricane Harvey, for uh, for uh, uh, Sandy, for other ones, and uh, so that you know we frequently had very, very good uh, and uh, estimates that were close to, to the ones that, uh, you know, happened actually in reality. And uh, we also are developing currently a transmission and distribution cost simulation tool that may be of interest to, to the, the states and regulators. Uh, we are working on some studies that are looking into designation of energy corridors. Uh, we are looking into security assessment of uh, critical infrastructures. And of course, we are also having projects dealing with the smart building technologies and uh, other things that uh, may be of interest to the states. Okay, thanks, sir. Now we will turn uh, to Jim to describe the Energy Zone mapping tool, uh, and he'll talk us through uh, how that works. Uh, Jim. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Jim Kuiper. I'm a geospatial engineer with Argonne National Laboratory, and um, if you go to the next slide, I'll be talking about the Energy Zones Mapping Tool. And um, it was originally initiated by um, uh, ICEPIC, the, um, one of the participants in the NCEP. And it was uh, funded by the Department of, en Department of Energy Office of Electricity. Uh, there was a three lab partnership of Argonne, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Oak Ridge. And uh, this was um, a large part of our technical support to ICEPIC. Uh, the tool was first la launched in 2013 uh, for public access. And um, it, you know, uh, in general, it's a publicly available web-based mapping tool for energy analysis. And um, even though the name is more specific, uh, Energy Zones Mapping Tool, uh, that kind of stems from the original uh, purpose and, and direction but as you'll see, it's a very um, versatile tool that could be used for a lot of similar purposes. Uh, so it includes a large geospatial data library. Uh, right now, the, there's about 320 layers. Uh, that varies as we add or, or retire layers. Um, and uh, one of the uh, notable parts of it is the suitability modeling. Uh, that includes um, areas modeling for areas that would be suitable, suitable for energy development. In other words, a particular power plant type, whether it's a photoelectric or nuclear power or coal or natural gas, um, they're models for, for just about any major technology. And then also for looking at corridor paths um, to see where um, they would be most optimal based on the input data. We also have a series of reports that can be dynamically generated from the database. So you specify the extent of area that you're interested in, and it will generate a location-specific support or report for you. All right, next slide. So the data library, and that, that's the catalog at the upper right, uh, can be ordered and filtered um, to uh, narrow it down to whatever you're interested in. Um, and then you can look at the main topics in the library are energy resources. So that'd be sources of power. You know, for example, for solar, it would be the amount of solar insulation um, that would be for different regions in the United States and then energy infrastructure, and then a lot of siting factors, um, things that come into play when you're trying to decide where a type of power plant or corridor would be likely to, to be suitable. Uh, there's also reference layers, uh, for example, boundaries and, and other um, background information, and a lot of environmental data because of uh, high participation by environmental groups in the original uh, project. Um, layers, as I mentioned, have metadata. Um, not all web-based tools let you see what the source of the data are, and and or even let it let you download it for your own use. Um, 
and uh, we're actively maintaining it. So uh, those, um, especially the most popular layers, the ones that are used and the ones most closely tied to the main focus of the tool are addressed um, frequently and kept up to date. Uh, so the example there is just um, the mapping interface uh, looking at wind turbines and electrical transmission in some of the plain states. And um, you can see the distribution of wind turbines is denser in some areas, even though the transmission grid is present in areas that are not. So um, there may be some opportunities for new locations um, just in taking a look at those two data layers together. All right, next slide. Uh, the modeling is um, is pretty unique. It's uh, the actual way the model works is is uh, well established. Um, it's called suitability modeling or uh, constraint modeling, and um, it spans nine energy resources. Uh, some of them are natural gas, solar, wind, and um, not corridor. Uh, <laughs> It's a mistake. Um, nuclear, coal, etc. Just the major sources that we use for generating power. And then there's uh, 40 pre-configured models. So those span, and they're very specific. So for example, there would be a land-based wind model that's geared toward 100 meter hub height uh, turbines. There's one specifically for utility scale photovoltaic solar, uh, combined cycle gas turbines, Etc. And then um, supporting those models are over 90 modeling layers. Um, so some of those, for example, would be the solar resource layer for photovoltaic, um, uh, distance to a 20, 220 kV or larger substation. There's a whole slew of those types of layers. Um, depending on what size power plant you're building, you might want to focus on a certain subset of substations or transmission lines, um, habitat, and obviously many more. And um, the interface, which I'm not gonna uh, show or demonstrate right now, um, but it is intuitive and flexible. Uh, you, you choose the layers that you wanna use, you weight them in order of importance, and within each model you can specify suitability uh, levels for subcategories um, on a scale of zero to 100. Um, you can start with the default model that's been designed by a subject matter expert. You could um, just run it as is or revise it as you want to change some of the preferences in the model, or you can design a model completely um, from scratch using anything in the, the modeling library. Okay. So quarter modeling, uh, well, uh, as you saw on the right there, those uh, the result of the model is sort of a heat map where um, higher or lower suitability on a scale of one to 100 uh, is generated. Uh, so what we did for corridors was start with a suitability map like that, where you would take into account um, different factors which would make a corridor more or less suitable. And then we generate uh, paths along that which um, maximizes suitability. So in the lower right, you can see examples of um, three different paths that were generated uh, between points A and B based on a uh, little bit different user preferences. Um, so for example, whether it be preferred to uh, follow existing um, corridors that can be high weighted higher or um, following major roads um, or other established rights of way through the landscape or de-emphasizing those and just seeing you know, what, what new path might be generated that hasn't already been um, used as a right-of-way. And what that typically does is generate um, a, a region to study for the corridor. So these wouldn't be the final pass. These would be um, in, uh, alternatives that you would investigate more closely to understand why, um, why you know, for example, why do they all um, go through that central point in one location. That's uh, more of a pinch point. And where they're more separated, that would be areas where there's a lot of variability and you might have a lot more options. Uh, so it can give you a lot of insights. 
Um, you can also just sketch a chord on the map. And for either uh, method, you can generate an extensive report that shows um, the characteristics along the pipeline, ranging from the jurisdictions it crosses to the topographic profile, to what um, habitat and protected lands it might um, cross, and many other variables. All right, next slide. So the reporting capability is pretty straightforward. There's 16 different topics, for example, power plant report or corridor or protected land report. And um, you can sketch an area on the map if you want to use that. You can upload an area, you know, for example, if you have your um, utility boundary or something in the database, you can just upload it that into the tool and use that as your boundary. Or you can use a state or county. And then you um, choose the report and ask it to run it for that jurisdiction. Uh, so these examples on the slide are sections of the quarter report uh, giving different information. Um, I know they're a little small, so um, uh, what I recommend is just um, take a look at the tool itself if you want to see some of this in more detail. All right, next slide. So um, as instead of a more abstract, I'd like to give you a few uh, use cases of how uh, the tool is designed to be used and what people use it for. Um, I would say that the first sub bullet there is, is pretty common uh, where somebody would just register for the tool and launch it and take a look at the data library, um, looking for data in a certain category that they need and um, download it for use or just view it on the map. Another common use would be to um, study your location of interest, uh, looking at the energy infrastructure or resources or other any of the other 320 layers can be superimposed on the map and uh, queried and you know, can zoom in close and, and really look at a lot of detail. Um, as far as modeling, um, you can look at either nationally or, or in a very local region, uh, which types of power plants would be more viable and why. So it gives a lot of insight and um, you might see an area that's highly suitable and you can dig into that. You can look at the model and, and see what, what went into that score. And um, there might be some other area that's surprisingly low suitability. You might see, um, you know, a constraint that you weren't aware of that would help um, make that a less viable location. Another example of modeling is, um, is to just contrast a model with and without uh, transmission in it and look at the suitability differences between the two and see where um, an increase in transmission capacity, you know, maybe planning that for the future would open up a new region for um, for, for um, gen power generation where it's highly suitable otherwise. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned, uh, to find a corridor route to avoid a lot of constraints, some of them which would be obvious and others which might not be. As far as the reports, uh, a really quick use is to, um, to look at the power generation portfolio for a given state or region um, just to see, you know, is this area dominated by nuclear or coal or wind? You know, how much has solar um, been adopted in this region? Um, it can very quickly generate a report like that. Um, and along the corridor, I mentioned, um, you can really see uh, specific constraints and um, you might see a steep area on the elevation profile and, and see that that'd be a little bit more challenging area to cross. You might adjust the corridor to avoid that, or you might find it that that'll just have to be there as you get a greater understanding for your corridor route. So there's a lot of versatile uses and, um, and these are just examples. All right, next slide. So just uh, to catch you up, if, if you've seen the tool in the past or heard a presentation about it, um, we uh, 
do have uh, newsletters we send out to registered users. There's a toggle to decide if you want to receive that or not. Um, and we do give periodic, periodic webinars, uh, usually in more depth in this quick introduction today. Um, we recently added those import and export tools that I mentioned. Um, so going into that a little bit more, if you were to generate uh, a corridor in the tool, you can export that for use in your own system. Or conversely, you could import a corridor and generate a corridor report for it. Um, the original extent of the tool and scope was the Eastern Interconnection, but um, several years ago, the, the mapping library was extended to the full extent of each data set that we were putting into it, usually um, for the 48 states and sometimes more states or even North America as, as the extent. Um, and we also extended many of the models. So in particular, solar, wind, and quarter models um, operate for the full 48 state region now. And a few of the examples of recently added data layers are one from the Nature's Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy recently published one called Site Wind Right. Um, it gets at some of the sensitive, sensitive environmental resources that um, would be affected by wind turbines, and um, as well as the wind resource itself and other of uh, the main characteristics. Um, natural gas compressor stations, petroleum refineries, and petroleum product terminals uh, were also recently added. Next slide. Uh, one of the uh, things that we had in the tool for many years is uh, commercial data from Platts. Uh, so that license um, was pretty expensive. And more recently, um, Highfield, which is uh, kind of coming from the DHS, um, added transmission line and substation data of pretty high quality. So we transitioned away from that license data and um, along with updating the mapping library, we updated all the models and modeling layers related to uh, transmission lines and added substation modeling layers. So now you can use uh, distance to substation, which is obviously where you would connect to a transmission line instead of just the transmission line. Um, and as a side activity um, funded outside of the main budget, uh, we did a pilot study um, and we're looking at how the EZMT could be leveraged for um, electrical vehicle charging station uh, and planning for that. So where would um, extending that network of charging stations be uh, well, where would new charging stations be most viable? Uh, the model would be very similar to the power plant models. All right, next slide. Um, so we often get asked who uses the tool, and um, there's been about 2,000 users who have registered for, to use it over the years uh, since it's been launched. Um, it's not Facebook, but um, it's a very specialized tool. So that's that's a lot of use. And um, these users are getting a tool that's, you know, a lot of effort has gone into putting it together so they can really leverage um, a lot of work by doing that. Um, and you can see there's a lot of uh, private industry that's using it. It spans all different levels of government, um, universities and educational users. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty diverse user community. All right, next slide. And just to close up, um, the tool is at EZMT at or .anl.gov. There's a link at the top right to register. And you know, the website's accessible, but um, the actual tool itself to launch it, there's a registration process. That's mainly um, to allow you to save your work. There's a lot of ways you can save it within the tool. So it allows you to have kind of a customized version of the tool. And if you have any questions, you can email ezmt at enl.gov. I uh, should also mention at the top right of the, the tool itself is a help menu. We have videos and a lot of help features to help you learn how to use it. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you for your presentation. Um, are there any questions? I guess you can use the chat feature uh, in the in the I guess WebEx uh, if you have questions. Uh, next, uh, if you would tell us and give us some examples of the state usage of EMZT to solve various problems. Um, well, uh, we don't look too deeply at what users are doing um, within the tool. Um, uh, but it, I would um, really emphasize the modeling as being a useful tool for users within the states, as well as some of the reports, because um, they can um, help you be aware of constraints, um, especially um, protected lands and habitat. There's a conservation easement database that plays into that. Uh, there's a lot of easements that would, you know, where lands are reserved even on private property for uh, conservation um, and wouldn't be considered viable for many energy projects. Um, yeah, and so in general, um, I don't know a lot about the specific uses that folks are, are putting it toward. However, I do see a lot of usage of the tool and um, I think the diverse audience speaks to that as 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 far as um, what people are finding value in. Okay. Thanks, sir. And if you have a question, uh, please type it in. Uh, next, we will turn to Vladimir to discuss pipes, uh, pump storage hydro valuation. Uh, Vladimir, would you please uh, let us know about this project? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Yes. Uh, so we all know that uh, pump storage hydro is an energy storage technology that is uh, commercially available and uh, proven and reliable technology. And uh, we also know that uh, in order to integrate a lot of clean energy resources like wind and solar, we need storage. So the question is uh, why we haven't had more of the pump storage uh, projects uh, developed in the last uh, 20 years or so. There was only one small project, uh, like a 40 megawatt uh, Lake Hodges uh, uh, pump storage project that was uh, commissioned in 2012. And that's uh, mostly uh, not really a pure pump storage project because it's uh, mostly like a pumping station. So there were no real big, uh, large, uh, you know, pump storage projects commissioned in the last 20 years or so. The last uh, big one was uh, in 1997. Uh, so the question is, okay, so why is that? I mean, there are a lot of good sites, and many of those good sites are actually closed-loop sites where you don't really have environmental issues because you're just, uh, you know, shuffling the water from one tap to another, and there is no fish in the lakes, uh, there is no, you know, biodiversity that is affected and so on. So it's uh, totally, totally isolated from the environment and uh, having minimal impact on the environment and so on. So one of the obstacles actually for the pump storage development uh, uh, was uh, that it was hard to develop a good business model for uh, the pump storage development and uh, you know have that uh, investment pay off in a reasonable time period. Uh, so the key issue was okay, you know how do we actually value the pump storage? So everybody knows that uh, those are valuable projects. Uh, but uh, you know what is the actual value to the system? What is the value to you know the owner and operator? What is the value to the you know uh, transmission operator and the utility and to the society as a whole? So that was big issue. So that's why DOE uh, initiated this project where we were tasked to look into uh, you know how to properly value pump storage projects. Uh, okay, so let's move to the next slide. So yeah, the study was, uh, you know, founded, uh, funded by the Department of Energy's uh, Water Power Technologies Office, office which is uh, WPTO, and the official title of the study is Evaluation Guidance and uh, Techno-Economic Studies uh, for Pump Storage Hydropower, and it's carried out under the WPTO Hydrovirus Initiative. That's a new initiative that uh, just started uh, last year, and. Uh, the project team comprises uh, five DOE national labs uh, that are led by Argon. Uh, let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, can we have next? Okay. So yeah. So the objective of the project uh, is uh, 
to advance uh, the state of the art in the assessment of value of palm storage hydropower plants and uh, their role and contributions in the power system. The specific goals uh, were to develop a comprehensive and transparent valuation guidance that will allow for consistent valuation assessments and comparisons of palm storage projects, then to test the palm storage valuation methodology by applying it to two selected palm storage projects, and then transfer and disseminate the palm storage valuation guidance to the industry, developers, and other stakeholders. So the illustration at the bottom of the slide basically provides a big picture for the project. Uh, we first uh, developed a draft valuation methodology and have that as a draft uh, valuation guidebook. And then we are applying this uh, guidebook to two test cases, uh, to two actual proposed uh, pump storage projects uh, that I'm going to be talking about in the next slide. Uh, so we are testing this methodology by doing these two test case studies for actual projects. Uh, and based on the lessons learned and the experience uh, during those uh, test case studies, we'll be revising the methodology and publishing the final pump storage valuation guidance. Next slide, please. So this is the project team organization. So the project is overseen by the WPTO, and uh, Sam Bakenhauer is the program manager for that. I am serving as the principal investigator. We have two industry partners. Those are uh, the Banner Mountain and Goldendale Pump Storage Hydro Projects. Uh, we are also having a technical advisory group, uh, and we are collaborating with the NARUC, uh, who is uh, you know, helping us uh, in uh, uh, coordinating the work uh, with the technical advisory group uh, and other project activities. And at the bottom, you see the five national labs that are participating on the project team here. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So these two industry partners that we are collaborating with, they have been selected uh, on a competitive basis uh, by DOE. So that was a DOE decision. They had a competitive process uh, to select uh, which two projects will serve as uh, test cases and uh, which uh, you know, ones will be uh, subject to, to all of these uh, technical economic studies that we are going to perform. So one is uh, the Banner Mountain pump, uh, pump Storage Project that is being developed by Epsiroka Energy. It's a 400 megawatt uh, applies uh, quaternary technology. It's a closed loop project, so you see that uh, these are two uh, reservoirs uh, that are not uh, connected to any active water flows uh, or lakes, and uh, it's located uh, near Casper, Wyoming. The other project is being developed by the National Grid and Rye Development jointly, and that's the Goldendale Energy Storage Project. It's a larger project. It's a 1,200 megawatt adjustable speed technology. It's also closed loop, and it's located just north of Oregon-Washington border. Next slide, please. And uh, we have an outstanding technical advisory group on the project here, and uh, we're also collaborating with NARUC as well. So the technical advisory group has 19 members, which include uh, regulators, which include uh, pump storage developers, utilities, uh, uh, original equipment manufacturers, uh, research institutions like uh, EPRI and so on. And uh, of, uh, you know, let me just mention the regulators here. So we have Dennis Bergeron from the Maine Public Utility Commission, and we also have Christine Erickson from Illinois Commerce Commission. And we are also collaborating closely with NARUC, Kerry Worthington, and uh, Chris Villarreal, who is uh, uh, the president of Plugged In Strategies and uh, serves as a consultant uh, to NARUC uh, for this project. Uh, next slide, please. So the key project tasks are outlined here on this slide. So some of these tasks are already completed. Like we have first conducted the extensive evaluation literature review. Then we have performed a cost and performance comparison of pump storage hydro and competing technologies, basically to get the data up to date and get all of the information that we need for developing the guidance and also later on for the techno-economic studies. So the report for that is uh, published already. And uh, also we have developed uh, this uh, draft uh, pump storage valuation guidance. Uh, we are currently conducting techno-economic studies for these two projects uh, that's in progress. 
We're also analyzing potential market revenues for these two projects. And uh, once we have completed these uh, analysis, we'll be then conducting the valuation. And also, after that, we'll be revising the pump storage valuation guidance and documenting the, the study findings. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So for the energy storage cost and performance study, the report was published last year, and the objective was to define and compare energy storage technology costs and evaluate these technologies across a variety of different uh, performance parameters. So in addition to pump storage hydropower, the study included uh, a variety of battery technologies, uh, including flow batteries, uh, and also some other technologies like uh, flywheels, uh, compressed air storage, ultracapacitors, and so on. So the report has been published and is available at the DOE website. And on the next slide, I'm going to just illustrate some key results from this study. So here you see lined up all of these different energy storage technologies, and including combustion turbine, because we wanted to include combustion turbine, although it's not an energy storage technology, but in many cases, people uh, people uh, suggest that uh, combustion turbines uh, could actually do uh, provide uh, some uh, services uh, similar to energy storage technologies, so, so we also wanted to have that uh, included in the study as well. So as you can see, pump storage hydropower is among the lowest cost uh, technology options uh, in terms of both annualized uh, dollar per kilowatt uh, and dollar per kilowatt hour costs. And we have the cost uh, base uh, for 2018, but also projections were made for 2025, assuming a certain technology development and cost reductions over the next five years or so. Uh, next slide, please. So in establishing this pump storage evaluation guidance, uh, some of the goals that we had uh, was that, uh, you know, they were that, uh, you know, we want to develop an objective and comprehensive methodology that uh, provides a consistent and repeatable valuation approach uh, and also transparent valuation process and results. Uh, and also it should be applied uh, and could be applied uh, to different types and sizes of pump storage hydropower plants uh, for, from you know, very small ones like uh, you know, a few megawatts uh, to very large sizes of 1,000 megawatts or so and uh, should be able to account for various services and contributions that uh, these plants provide to the grid and also to consider the benefits and costs over time, because these are long-lived projects uh, with a very long lifetime. And also the methodology should be applicable to both the traditional and the restructured market environments uh, and can be used uh, by stakeholders with the different perspectives so that it could be used by the developer, it could be used uh, by the, the, you know, the regulator, or it could be used by the utility or um, market operator or whoever wants to, to examine the, the and, uh, of course, uh, it should be publicly available so that everybody can use it and uh, understand, you know, what are uh, the, the, the analysis and the process that was applied. Next slide, please. So in developing this uh, evaluation guidance, we didn't start from, uh, from scratch. Uh, we actually leveraged uh, numerous uh, current and past efforts in this area. So, so you all know that uh, there have been a number of different evaluation studies uh, that were done for, for different technologies. Uh, so we looked uh, through all of those, uh, through the literature review process, uh, and we basically, uh, you know, uh, mostly used uh, some of these sources that are listed here for establishing this uh, draft evaluation guidance. Uh, so we relied uh, a lot on uh, two DOE-funded studies uh, that were done by, you know, GRID, uh, a modernization Laboratory Consortium, GMLC, that's uh, including multiple labs. One is the development of valuation framework. That's a very general valuation framework in nature that could be applied uh, to different technologies. And also the metrics analysis, which was developing the metrics uh, for different uh, power system attributes. Uh, we also uh, used uh, quite a bit uh, from uh, some uh, past uh, EPRI studies uh, especially you know, the benefit-cost framework for distributed energy resources and guidebook for cost-benefit analysis for smart grid demonstration projects. Uh, we also uh, leveraged some of the past work that we did at Argon and some other labs. And as I mentioned, uh, we did uh, review a lot of other studies that uh, did valuation of different technologies. 
because the evaluation process uh, in many aspects uh, is the same uh, regardless of the technology, just maybe services are different and so on. So that all actually contributed to our uh, draft uh, pump storage evaluation guidance, which is uh, a detailed step-by-step uh, -step methodology for evaluation and assessment of uh, pump storage projects. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So the tech economic studies for the Banner Mountain and Golden project include a variety of analyses that we carry out uh, to assess the costs and benefits of various uh, pump storage services and uh, grid contributions. So Argon will be doing uh, or is doing uh, several studies right now. Uh, one is the capacity evaluation, and we're applying Aurora model for that. Uh, we're also doing the historical electricity market analysis using the PMAT model. And we're also developing our own model to, de uh, to, to is estimate the value of Black Star service. Uh, Anvil is uh, looking into ancillary services, and they are running Plexus model to, to examine the values of regulation services, uh, contingency reserves, uh, flexibility reserves, and so on. Idaho National Lab is focusing on the power system stability services, like uh, inertial response, governor response, transient most instability, voltage support, and so on. Enel is also going to be looking into the impacts of pump storage hydro operation on the system cycling and ramping costs, because uh, if, uh, if uh, pump storage is uh, taking a lot of ramping and cycling, then other units have more uh, steady load uh, to serve, so, so they have uh, less need to, to cycle and ramp up and down. Uh, Oak Ridge is going to be looking into the impacts of that type of variation on the pump storage itself, so how much wear and tear the pump storage will experience because of that type of operation. And then we'll also look into some other system-wide effects, like uh, integration of variable renewable resources, the emissions, and so on. And uh, PNL will look into transmission benefits. They are looking into congestion relief, transmission, uh, transmission investment deferral, and uh, uh, those things. And uh, finally, Oak Ridge is going to be also looking into some uh, valuation of non-energy services, uh, something like uh, water management, uh, socioeconomic benefits, uh, and impacts, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So these are uh, quite a few studies. Uh, each of these basically is a study in itself. So those are very complex analyses. And uh, once we have the results of all of these analyses, we can then uh, perform the evaluation process because we have the, the uh, inputs uh, with regard to the values of different services. Uh, can we have next slide, please? Okay, so this is uh, the proposed evaluation process, and uh, it is basically a cost-benefit and decision analysis framework. It consists of 15 steps, but those steps you know, are arranged in some kind of an order, but some of these steps can be actually performed in parallel, so it doesn't necessarily need to be exact order as it is presented here. I'm not going to go through all of these steps in detail. I'm just going to mention that they are grouped into four main groups. One is defining the scope for evaluation, then the second group is developing evaluation criteria. Third is designing the analysis. And then the fourth is running the analysis to determine and evaluate results. So all of that is important. So, so notice here that, okay, step 12 is conducting cost-benefit analysis for each alternative. And uh, step uh, 13 is performing the risk assessment. And then 14 is uh, performing multi-criteria decision analysis before we compare the various document analysis and report the findings. I'll uh, address uh, these a little bit more on the next slide. So as I said, it's uh, basically a cost-benefit and decision analysis framework. Uh, so the cost-benefit analysis is a typical traditional uh, cost-benefit analysis where you put all of the costs on one side, uh, all of the benefits on the other side. You calculate the net present value of uh, costs and benefits and find uh, the net present value of the project uh, and also calculate the benefit-cost ratio and other economic parameters. Uh, so that, that's uh, totally traditional, and that's something that you know, uh, you know, many of the users of the methodology may actually stop at this point uh, and say, yeah, 
this is what we needed and this is what uh, we have calculated. However, uh, in some of the you know grid services that uh, pump storage hydropower plants uh, provide, you know they you know many of them are monetized uh, because there are some uh, uh, revenue streams that you can uh, obtain for those in the markets, uh, or you can assess uh, the value of those in monetary terms in uh, you know the regulated utilities. But many are actually hard to monetize, uh, difficult to monetize, because uh, either there is no, uh, you know, market for that, uh, or those are things that are, uh, you know, uh, available uh, by default, like inertia, and there is no remuneration now for for that service. So if we move to the next slide, uh, we have a step which includes uh, multi-criteria decision analysis, which may help us also examine or compare the alternatives that include both monetized and non-monetized services and contributions. So the example that is shown here, alternative one and alternative two, uh, you can see that uh, you know, the cost of alternative one is lower than alternative two, that alternative two is more expensive. So if you just uh, use cost as your decision-making parameter, Obviously, you'll go with alternative one because that one is uh, cheaper. But uh, notice that uh, alternative two actually provides greater reliability and has lower environmental impacts. So now taking those two, which are uh, in this case non-monetized, but uh, are, uh, are uh, you know, calculated in terms of uh, you know, qualitative and uh, some other uh, metrics, how then to determine which alternative is better? So that's what uh, we can do using the multi criteria decision analysis because that one allows us uh, to do trade-offs among different objectives and attributes and so on and determine you know, how much uh, the increase the reliability is uh, valued in terms of you know, cost or environmental impacts and so on. So that's what uh, you know, some of the users of the methodology may want to do if they want to take into account both the monetized and non-monetized uh, attributes and metrics. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So the key products of this uh, pump storage hydro evaluation project we include, of course, the pump storage evaluation guidebook, uh, and it will be accompanied by two technical reports illustrating the applications of that methodology for two actual projects. Uh, here we have the projects uh, for uh, Banner Mountain and Goldendale here described uh, and, uh, and uh, illustrated how the methodology was applied uh, for the valuation of these projects. Uh, of course, uh, the valuation that is going to be done here is only for test purposes. It's not going to be the valuation that uh, is going to be definitive uh, for those projects. That's something that uh, can be done later on. But we wanted just to illustrate uh, uh, the, the, the application of the methodology and test the methodology here. So the results. Uh, are not uh, the ones that are uh, totally you know, definitive and final for, for these two projects. Uh, uh, we're also having this energy cost, uh, storage cost, and performance study, which uh, is already published. And we're also in parallel in a companion project. Uh, we are going to be developing a valuation tool that will actually help the users navigate uh, the pump storage valuation process. Uh, so we'll have this uh, as a user-friendly online tool, possibly, that will help the users navigate the process. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, this is the, my, uh, my, my uh, last slide here. Uh, and uh, the major project outcomes will include basically a comprehensive, transparent, consistent, and repeatable valuation methodology, a cost-benefit and decision analysis framework that will allow for valuation of both monetized and non-monetized services and contributions. Uh, it will also help an increased understanding of uh, the grid value of pump storage power plants among various stakeholders, including utilities and market operators, developers, regulators, and so on. And also a valuation framework that uh, will be easily you know, possible to generalize and adopt uh, for uh, other storage technologies. So, so we think that uh, this kind of methodology can be easily generalized and uh, customized also for other storage technologies, not only to be uh, for pump storage, but also to be for uh, you know, battery storage or uh, flywheels or uh, any other storage technology. So that is my last slide. Uh, Thank you so much for your attention, and uh, I would be very happy to answer any questions. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, we do have a few questions, two that relate to EZMT and one that relates to our pump storage. I'll start with Jim. Two questions. Um, one, um, security implications of the breadth of data. Uh, and two is, um, is load, uh, does the model have data on load? So, Jim, if you will please answer those two questions. Sure. Um, so the security question has been raised, and um, especially during the early development, we went through a process with, um, you know, a review of that, kind of a, a security review. And uh, one of the main aspects of it is the tool is really a compilation of otherwise available data. And um, in particular, substations are uh, served through the um, an open web-based tool um, as a map service. So uh, the data that we're using for substation is already publicly available in another place, and uh, we're merely hosting it as well. Um, I, I wouldn't dismiss that concern. Um, it's something that does come to mind. Um, uh, we do block the site from export controlled countries as one um, one approach and um, you know the uh, registrations are reviewed it would be not too hard to um, to circumvent that because it's self-reported data but um, but that's at least a little bit of a, um, a way of addressing that um, Oh, the other question about load. Uh, we do not have data on load either in the infrastructure data or the um, the model input layers. Um, that's not. Um, I haven't encountered that as uh, publicly available data or something that could be applied um, with the national tool. But it, I, I definitely agree that that would be very useful and um, I'd be now, very. Do you have utility services map? service territories mapped out? Um, yes, I believe so. Um, I don't have it right in front of me, but we um, I believe that's in the tool. Okay. Okay, and, and one question for Vladimir. Can, can, can water towers, are there potential for water tower usage for pumped hydro storage? Is that a possibility? Uh, water tower uh, usage, okay, so water tower don't really uh, have, a, you know, there is a theoretical potential for that, but that would be a very small amount of water that could be used, and the power that can be obtained from water towers are uh, small. So we had, uh, you know, some uh, concepts that we looked at in the past uh, where multiple water towers uh, could be, uh, you know, combined together to provide uh, for a larger quantity of water for use in the uh, like a pump storage uh, hydro scheme. But that's uh, something that uh, still is a research topic. Uh, so, so it's still something that uh, hasn't been uh, uh, developed anywhere, I guess. So it's really a scale issue then with respect to the water tower. We'd... Right. It doesn't scale well enough. Yep. Okay. Well, Thank you both for your presentation. I hope you can see, I hope our audience can see the breadth and the level of detail of the analysis of these experts, and we'll present other experts from other labs later. So thank you for your time and participation, uh, Vladimir and Jim. And uh, the slides will be available through NARUC. And I'd also like to thank Carrie uh, for her work in setting this up. And with that, uh, We'll oh, Carrie. Yep. I just want really quickly. Um, I did get a question about where you can find the um, hydro wires um, report on energy storage technology and cost characterization report. Um, I did find it on the hydro, hydro wires initiative website. Um, so it is it is located there, uh, and the link is um, in the presentation. Um, yes. Thank you all, and great conclusion, Commissioner Thomas. And thank you all. Uh, sorry that we went over. Uh, we try not to do that. Um, any unanswered questions will be forwarded to the presenters. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank